So how do we get to robotics? How do we get, you know, we see that as the, the end of this centralization of consumer tax. But it seems like, just like we've seen in the automotive space, we have to go through this hybrid stage where we move, you know, to get to a, an electric vehicle, we have to kind of work our way through this process. We don't just end up there. How do we do that as we sensorize consumer tech? Well, I think even, even the robotics part is a subset of a larger shift. That, you know, for the last, uh, starting in the 90s when MEMS came on board and we started getting cheap, reasonable sensors, we started out with individual sensors. And then we started clustering those into little islands of systems. So Doug mentioned the asthma inhaler with a communication system so you can start doing public, you know, public health issues. We're, we're taking those islands and turning them into archipelagos of sensors. So, you know, the island of sensors, an automobile today, you know, cars, even without a, a, an electric, electric engine, car only looks like a car. It's really just a computer. I mean, if you look at the value added, the only reason they put wheels on Mercedes is to keep the computers from dragging on the highway. And so you've got the computers, so you have this island of sensors in the car, and then you say, can I connect it to the archipelago of other vehicles and like intelligent highway vehicle system? And then say, can we link all of those things together? That's happening very steadily. But it also means, in my opinion, the real problem right now is no longer the sensors. It's the upstream stuff. It's the communicate, designing communications. Uh, for machines talking to machines. Uh, it's designing, uh, you know, at chip level, we need to integrate, you know, instead of uh, chips that happen to have sensors on them, we need sensors that happen to have uh, processing power. And I think that's going to accelerate the robots. I'm not so sure I'm that comfortable with, the, with thinking about it in terms of robots, because there's so many stereotypes about robots and, and um, I, I do think the notion of moving from kind of sensors to sensory networks to to autonomous uh, systems that can actually do things without human intervention, whether it's physical or, or virtual, is something that's important and is going to happen. But I'm just worried if we think about it in terms of robots, then people are going to have that stereotyped image of you know robots from the 60s science fiction. Movies. Well, in defense of robots. Um, because and, and I, I'm in complete agreement, but Silicon Valley specializes in doing things that freaks people out. Uh, <laughs> someone's going to freak the world out with robots. It should be us for the sake of our property values. Uh, <laughs> take automotive robots, which I mean, today I look at the robot industry as kind of like a donut. That that the part you can eat, the circle around the edge, is industrial robots, military robots, uh, automotive systems, and the hole at the center is the consumer piece. Everything is in place to have a killer, that's probably the wrong term, uh, popular consumer robot. It's just nobody has come up with the idea yet. But take automotive stuff. Robots are clearly on the curve of Moore's Law. Grand Challenge won May 2004, 150 mile course, you know, only five robots got only any distance. The one that got furthest got seven kilometers. It looked like Monty Python. Almost 18 months later, exactly one period of a doubling on Moore's Law, the second grand challenge, 22 out of 23 robots got farther than the first robot got in the first grand challenge, and five robots finished. Third grand challenge, November 2007, I think it was, um, the urban grand challenge, uh, we demonstrated that robots may be primitive, but they understand the California vehicle code better than we do. And so while people get freaked out about robots, uh, I'm actually, you know, I don't know about you, I drove down 280 this morning. I'd rather have robots driving in this weather than people. And, and of course, the ultimate proof was about a month before the story broke, I saw a very odd thing on Highway 280. And, and as a forecaster, I look for things that don't fit. And, and the weirdest goddamn thing, there was a Prius that was actually going the speed limit on Highway 280. And, and I noticed on its roof it had a Velodyne sensor, but no camera. And I thought, well, that's not a Google Street View vehicle. So I crept up behind it, and I looked, and I took a picture, and I came over to the driver's side. Here's the driver sitting like this. And I backed off, and I went the other side, the geek at the screen on the other side. And I said, you know, Sebastian Thrun's done it. Because I teach at Stanford, and what we had noticed was occasionally a really bright engineering student would, like, disappear. It was like the Manhattan Project, you know. Like, you know oh, he's working at Google. Uh, well, it was one of the Google street bots. Google has been running 
street robots in the wild for over a year. Uh, they've done like 140,000 miles on the road. And I've seen the, the, the Google map tracks of these routes. They've gone down Lombard Street. They've gone down Highway 1. So just imagine this. You are sitting in a Prius on Highway 1 with your arms folded. There's 300 foot drop on this side, a cliff on this side, and a bunch of Midwesterners in, in RVs uh, coming the other way. You trust the robot. This stuff, you know, ready or not, it is, you know, you can feel it just heading towards liftoff. 